Injury news here for the Clippers. Paul George was hurt late in the fourth quarter of that Clippers loss to the Thunder last night. George collided with Lou Dort, stayed down for several minutes. See, there had to be help off the court. Ty Lu said George is still being evaluated. You know, the Clippers have certainly struggled with injuries. When you talk about the George and Kawhi this season, especially they played just 35 games this season without both of them on the floor going 14 and 21. But when they both are on the floor, that record 10 games over 500. So we got Woj back here. We got legs back here. And, and Woj, you got to give us, give us the update. What, what are you hearing about Paul George and that leg? Well, uh, it certainly looked like a hyperextension at the least last night. Mm. Um, that injury, he was taken out of the arena on a cart, uh, had that right leg, that right knee extended on the cart. And, you know, I'm told today, uh, I'm told today that, uh, you know, he's going to get the imaging on that right knee. I think it takes time to de-stress uh, uh, a knee overnight into today. So the, certainly the imaging today, but yeah. a lot of concern certainly around this Clippers team uh, with Paul George and the chance that this is a significant injury. We saw the numbers when both of those guys are on the floor. In, in your, how does this affect the Clippers going forward, man? Well, listen, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't know exactly the status of Paul George. I was watching the game live when it happened, and I shuddered when I watched it the first time I saw the replay. As, as Woj said, hyperextension at minimum. I, I think it might have been a worse hyperextension even than the one that Giannis had in the postseason a couple years ago. We were shocked he came back from that. So. Who knows what the overall extent's going to be, but if Paul George misses, you know, the rest of the year or the rest of the regular season and tries to come back for the playoffs, I, I think this could cook the Clippers' chances. And I've actually been holding out hope that this was one team, along with Phoenix, once we see Kevin Durant, that could potentially beat Denver. But if, if, if Paul George is not around, I don't see how the Clippers are possibly going to be able to pull that off. They have a deep team, but you can't miss that much offense. Listen, you saw how they literally carried him uh, back to the locker room. I want to take a look at the standings here, folks. You know, the injury for the Clippers comes really at a bad time. They're fifth in the West standings, but just two games from dropping out of the entire playoff pick, play in picture. Uh, five and 12 is separated by less than basically two games. Lakers won those teams in the mix. They have basically a half game back of the play in tournament and a one and a half behind that important six seed. So, what do you think um, can a full strength, I guess, Lakers team, you think, make any noise in well, the postseason? You can't completely dismiss a team that's got LeBron James suited up and Anthony Davis at the same time yeah. and they're healthy. Having said that, look, in the NBA, my experience has been you don't slap something together at the end of the year and go make a run through the Western Conference, okay? So even if you get into the play-in, look at potentially who they could get in the play-in. There are some very dangerous teams in that group that are also going to be getting key pieces back as well. So, look, I, I'm beyond giving the Lakers the benefit of the doubt based on how little they have been together this year and how irrelevant the regular season has seemed to them. When you look at the mountain you're going to have to climb and the teams you're going to have to beat in the West, I'm not holding out much hope that they even survive the play-in, much less then get into the postseason and make a run. I'll say this, though. If they happen to win two games in the play-in, yeah. right, and now they're feeling a little bit better about themselves, what a reward for a team like Denver in the year that they had. Oh, by the way, your first-round opponent is going to be the Lakers, who just got LeBron James back. So you can't ever completely write them off, but just past experience tells us teams just don't do that get together at that time of the year, then make a run through the West with such little time together healthy. And I think the operative word in my question was full strength. So if that's the case, what about LeBron James? Give us a status on the foot. Hey, yeah, Brian, the, the, the Lakers are hopeful that they're going to get LeBron James back before the end of the season, whether that's at the very tail end of the regular season in a couple of weeks or perhaps at the start of the play-in tournament, which I think odds are right now in some capacity, 7 through 10 they would be in. Uh, if indeed they jump back into the picture, they're a uh, half game behind uh, that 10th spot right now. James' former teammate Mario Chalmers has some harsh words to say about uh, players fearing the king. I want you guys to take a listen to this. Nobody fears Gronk. Nobody's like, damn, I gotta go play against Gronk tonight. Nobody said that. I don't know why. Right. 
because I've seen people be scared when they actually line up to them, but they're not scared thinking about that match. Right. You hear anybody from that era talk about going against Jordan, there's a fear. Right. So when you have people that fear a player, then that's telling you something different already. Like, Jordan's just that guy. All right. Former teammate LeBron, what, what do you take from the comments? Yeah, well, look, I played in that decade of 1990 to 2000. I believe a guy won six rings during that time. So I played against Jordan a little bit. The one thing I had a problem with is the word fear. Mm. You know, you know, I didn't fear Michael Jordan. I don't know that anybody that did. That word, to me, is pretty strong. Now, can you say that you know you understood what you were getting into, this relentless attacking player? I've never played against anybody that was that relentless. Every time they touched it, they wanted to go. I think that nature, right, that killer instinct and how he wanted to go at you is what he's talking about. When it comes to LeBron, the nature of their game is different. Right, the way he approaches it, the way he has to facilitate, set the table, play point guard, get people involved. I think really that's what Mario Chalmers is talking about. I didn't take this as disparaging toward LeBron. It was more complimentary toward Michael Jordan. But again, if I'm using the word fear, the only guy that even approached that in my time in the league was Shaq. And it wasn't for me because I didn't have to guard him. Yeah. But, but, but centers, like, yeah. you know, you could see, like, lacing up yeah. the shoes the night they got to go against Shaq because he could not only beat you, he could put you Physical. in a sports center clip Absolutely. for eternity, yes. right, and embarrass you. And, and so he was the only guy physically, I think, that approached that category. But I really don't think Chalmers was going hard at LeBron. I think this is more about complimenting Jordan. Speaking of LeBron, what, what about the health? What about the foot? When are we going to give us an update? Listen, there, there's just two-plus weeks left in the regular season. I think the Lakers are hopeful that they're going to get LeBron James back either before the play-in or the Western Conference playoffs. Uh, there's right now a, a half game out of that final play-in spot. You're seeing a lot of jockeying in the West, uh, but this is a serious foot injury. Uh, I think they're, they're still optimism, though, that they will get him back before uh, this season is over, whether that's at the very tail end of the regular season or maybe it's uh, right at the start of the play. Mm. Hardwood and some basketball. Celtics, Kings. How about the Kings? They're third right now in the West. We picked this game up in the second Ooh, quarter. Jason Tatum going right to the rim. Lays it in with the left hand. Celtics down three at this point. Just three seconds left here in the quarter. Celtics up three. Tatum in the lane. Drive and one. He would hit the free throw. Celtics up six at the half. Get to the third now. Jalen Brown. Driving, Jalen Brown, scoring. He had 27. Celtics up seven. Under two minutes later, Brown right to the rack. Lead is 12 for the seed. And then it's Tatum. The step back, I want to kiss myself. Tatum's 39th, 30-point game of the season. You know, that ties Larry Bird for the most in Celtics history. And then, for good measure, another one with the left hand. He had 36 Celtics go on to win this one, 132 to 109. Now, before the game, Jalen Brown did an interview with The Ringer where he had some comments about his future there in Boston. Take a look. He said, quote, I don't know. As long as I'm needed, it's not up to me. We'll see how they feel about me over time and how I feel about them over time. Hopefully, whatever it is, it makes sense. But I will stay where I'm wanted. I will stay where I'm needed and treated correct, end quote. Okay, so with that, I got Tim Legler here with me. We got Woj back in here. I guess, Woj, what are you hearing? Is this window of for the Celtics now closing when we talk about this great pairing of Tatum and Brown? First of all, I think every window in the NBA is limited, whether players are under contract or going to become a free agent. Because having a player signed to an extension doesn't mean you're going to have him. Because the day a player asks out, he's typically going to get a trade. Listen, I don't think Jalen Brown was happy that he was involved in trade discussions with the Nets last summer with Kevin Durant. Uh, but I think Boston knows, I think with, with Jalen Brown, with Jason Tatum, you have to treat every year as though this is your best chance to win one, uh, to win one and then win another because as talented as Boston is, probably the deepest roster in the league, uh, this is a year-to-year -year proposition in the NBA. He's got one year left on his deal. Uh, he could do an extension uh, next summer. Again, with a new collective bargaining agreement and the ability to do 
a richer percentage of your contract as an extension. He could get more money than uh, might be available right now under the CBA, but I think for Boston, they understand the urgency of winning now, and I think with Jalen Brown, listen, he is a thoughtful individual, and not every player is going to give up his leverage when he talks publicly about it. I didn't think the comment was that incendiary. I thought it was he left it open-ended. Well, I, so. thought, I thought the interesting thing, Legs, was that he not only said that, but he also said that look, he was concerned when he heard about his name being bandied about in the Kevin Durant. So much so that he said he got on a three-way with Stevens and Jason Statham. And he said, I had to ask Stevens personally, are you trying to trade me? And Jason Tatum, I heard you've been working out with Katie. Are you been pushing for this? When you hear a player make these kind of statements, what do you take from it? And something else he said, which was kind of funny to me, he said, I'm from the South. And when you come in your house in the South, you come in the front door. You don't operate in the back door. Basically what he was saying was all the behind the scenes talk about possibly being traded and no one was coming to him and talking to him directly. So he was putting his message out there. I agree with Woj. I don't think what he said was all that bad. Really what he's doing is being realistic about the nature of the NBA. The Celtics are going to take care of their business interests. And that's all he's saying. So he's prepared for anything. And I thought the comments were actually kind of refreshing because he was open and honest. As far as, you know, are there, is there window closing? Possibly with these two guys. But here's the thing. He's an asset one way or another. So if Jalen Brown isn't in a Celtics uniform, he's not walking out the door without compensation. Mm. Right? He'll be moved and they're going to get back incredibly valuable assets and they have a top five player in the NBA on their roster. So that window isn't closing in terms of the Celtics competing for a title. We'll see what happens going forward with these two guys. But, man, were they impressive last night. That was one of their best performances of the last two months and the worst home loss for the Kings all year. Hall of Famer and Knicks legend Willis Reed, he died yesterday at the age of 80. Known simply as, really, the captain. Reed was the Rookie of the Year in 1965. He was MVP in 1970. But his place in history was forever etched on May 8th, 1970, in the Game 7 of the NBA Finals against the Lakers. Here comes Willis. And, of course, the crowd goes wild. Take a listen to this. Uh, here comes Willis. And the crowd is going wild. Yes, Marv Albert said those words, the iconic call as Reed Miss game six with that severe thigh injury, stunned the sellout crowd. He walked out of the tunnel, then scored the first two baskets of the game. Really, his only points of the game. That emotion just lift, propelled the Knicks to a championship. Reed's Knicks would win another one in 73. His number 19 was the first retired by the franchise. And, of course, he was elected into the Hall of Fame in 1982. Green's off today, but he tweeted this. His perspective on Willis Reed, quote, there have been greater players in Willis Reed. There has never been a greater leader. Rest in peace, Captain. Fans of the Knicks will love you until the end of time. All right, Sal Powell joins us back here at the desk. Listen, you grew up during the great Knicks championship eras. In your opinion, the legacy of Willis Reed. You guys all remember 1970, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, see this right here? I was 16 years old in 1970, so I remember exactly the moment where I was, and I was in my bedroom on Long Island listening to the game on the radio, uh, and I, I can just remember how emotional it was for young Knicks fans like myself just how important he was as a player with Clyde Frazier, Barnett, DeBusher. DeBusher went to my church, St. Anne's in Garden City, Long Island. So, you know, it was all part of the Knicks family there. And I remember interviewing him many years later when he was the GM of the Nets. And uh, he was just this gentle giant of a man. Right, Woj? Yep. Right, Lex? He was just unbelievably kind and sincere and, and wanted to tell me everything he knew about basketball. And you could just tell, that's what made him a great leader on the court, and then he built great teams off the court. Yeah, we, we remember, Walsh. Yeah, I, I knew Willis Reed as a front office executive mm -hmm. with the Nets, with New Orleans. It, nobody that I've ever been around in the NBA more respected and beloved by his peers. And not just the players who played with him, the guys who played against them. And then as a front office executive, a mentor, to young black executives mm -hmm. in the league, young black coaches in the league. Uh, he was a head coach in the NBA. He was a head coach at Creighton uh, on the college level. You know, he had a whole second act after a Hall of Fame playing career. 
Uh, I don't know if the end, I don't think this is a hole the NBA can fill. The void of losing Willis Reed and his place in history, it is unmatched. You talk about a mountain of a man and mm -hmm. a fighter. Peter McConville, who oversees this show, gave me some insight. All you got to do is Google Willis Reed fights the Lakers. He took on the whole team.